Good evening. So, so in the church, we have these awesome holy cards, uh, memorial cards for Pope Benedict. So make sure when you go to Mass this weekend to grab one. And so we're going to begin tonight with the prayer, which is on that card, which we're sharing here in our parish. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and loving God, we remember with great joy and thanksgiving your beloved Son, Pope Benedict XVI, an outstanding spiritual pope for seven years, who then made history by resigning and becoming His Holiness Benedict XVI, Roman Pontiff Emeritus. Welcome him into your kingdom with open arms as you welcome all your good and faithful servants. As a scholar, teacher, and ambassador of compassion and justice, Pope Benedict proclaimed your abiding love for all your children, and especially the poor and marginalized throughout the world. May we, return, may we learn from his example and in his memory deepen our faith to dedicate ourselves more fully to the works of the church and to love and serve you as faithfully and profoundly as he did. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let the perpetual light shine upon him. May his soul and souls of all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to begin with a quotation from a book that I'm going to tell you more about, which is not the book that we're talking about tonight, but is extremely important for understanding the book that we are talking about tonight. The primary and exclusive aim of the liturgy is not the expression of the individual's reverence and worship for God. It is not even concerned with the awakening, formation, and sanctification of the individual soul as such. Nor does the onus of liturgical action and prayer rest with the individual. It does not even rest with the collective groups composed of numerous individuals who periodically achieve a limited and intermittent unity in their capacity as the congregation of a church. The liturgical entity consists rather of the united body of the faithful as such, the church, a body which infinitely outnumbers the mere congregation. The liturgy is the church's public and lawful act of worship and is performed and conducted by the officials whom the church herself has designated for that post, her priests. In the liturgy, God is to be honored by the body of the faithful, and the latter is in its turn to derive sanctification from this act of worship. It is important that this objective nature of the liturgy should be fully understood. Here, the Catholic conception of worship in common sharply differs from the Protestant, which is predominatingly individualistic. The fact that the individual Catholic, by his absorption into the higher unity, finds liberty and discipline originates in the twofold nature of man who is both social and solitary. Okay, does anybody know who wrote these words? Okay, well, it's important. That's why we're here tonight, to learn more, right? So when the Italian priest Romano Guardini, who was born in 1885 and passed away in 1968, wrote these words in 1930, they were considered absolutely revolutionary. Okay. Uh, people read this and they thought, okay, who is this lunatic who has completely lost his mind, right? Uh, there were a few people who were like, huh, yeah, that's kind of interesting, but it just didn't seem right with the way that many Catholics for many centuries kind of approached the mystery of divine worship. Now, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, Okay, there was an entire theological renewal that was going on in the life of the church. And that centered around a rediscovery of the church. And what I mean by a rediscovery is not like the church kind of you know, disappeared all of a sudden and then, oh, we found it again, right? But remember that with the Council of Trent in the 16th century, that the church was struggling uh, against various conceptions in its battle with Protestantism, right? Because many Protestant Christians were saying that the church is essentially an invisible institution, right? It's a matter of the heart. And so the church said, no, it's more than that. It is a visible institution, right? There are real bonds of communion that are necessary in order to be the church. And one of the words that came from that time period was societas perfecta, right? a perfect society. 
Now, you may be sitting there tonight and thinking, have you seen the church, right? But it doesn't mean perfect in the sense of without sin. It means that it has everything within it uh, which is necessary for its proper functioning. So that was the kind of idea of the church with the Council of Trent. But there was this kind of ferment in theology to say, okay, maybe there's more to the life of the church than just being a visible institution that has everything that it needs in order to be a society. So theologians sought to root a renewed conception of the church in the biblical idea of the mystical body of Christ. Now, in the late Middle Ages, there had already become uh, evident this whole spirit of radical individualism, okay? And that spirit of radical individualism over time began to be seen even in the worship of the church. So not everywhere, but in many places, the priest did his thing at the altar, right? And then the faithful all did their own thing as individuals in the pews, right? So father would be saying mass, and then some people would be following along with every word he was saying, and then some people would be praying the rosary, and some people would be lighting candles to St. Anthony, uh, and everything was kind of discombobulated, right? There's a famous story uh, which, you know, who knows if it's actually true or not, but uh, Vivaldi, the famous composer, was a priest, and he was infamous for, uh, during mass, you know, conducting these orchestras, singing mass, and then when he wasn't going out for a smoke break, he was praying his office in the middle of it. So, kitty, LA, son, I gotta get this done. Okay, here we go. So, yeah, it seems very strange for us today, right? Uh, but that was kind of what was happening around this time period. The fundamental unity of sacrament and sacrifice of priest and people and the church and her worship, okay? It was still there because it's a theological truth, but it was obfuscated. It wasn't as apparent and obvious in the lived experience of Christians in the church. And thinkers like Romano Guardini, you know, I started out with his quote at the beginning of my talk tonight, they were convinced that a return to an authentic understanding of the Mass as the corporate worship of the body of Christ would spur a much-needed renewal in a church battered by centuries of revolution, rebellion, and reform. Now, Josef Ratzinger described the situation of the liturgy at the time Guardini was writing, okay? And then he jumped forward to the reality that faced the liturgy when he wrote the following words in the year 2000, okay? So think about, you know, all of a sudden you've got Guardini coming up with these, you know, notions that seem very strange at the time, right, which were very revolutionary. And then you have Ratzinger, you know, basically commenting on the liturgy now. He said, we might say that the liturgy was rather like a fresco in the early 20th century when Guardini was writing. It had been preserved from damage, but it had been almost completely overlaid with whitewash by later generations. In the missal from which the priest celebrated, the form of the liturgy that had grown from its earliest beginnings was still present, but as far as the faithful were concerned, it was largely concealed beneath instructions for and forms of private prayer. The fresco was laid bare by the liturgical movement, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, and in a definitive way by the Second Vatican Council. For a moment, its colors and figures fascinated us. But since then, the fresco has been endangered by climatic conditions, as well as by various restorations and reconstructions. In fact, it is threatened with destruction if the necessary steps are not taken to stop these damaging influences. Of course, there must be no question of its being covered with whitewash again, but what is imperative is a new reverence in the way we treat it, a new understanding of its message and its reality, so that rediscovery does not become the first stage of irreparable loss. So we mentioned the liturgical movement. Okay, Is that a phrase that you've 
are familiar with, if you heard of the liturgical movement at all. So, okay. If you're a Prince of Peace, you probably have and didn't know it, right? So, so, so the liturgical movement actually began in the 19th century as a movement of spiritual renewal in monastic circles. As religious life was reborn in places like Salem, okay, if you ever heard a Gregorian chant CD in the 1980s, uh, then, you know, Salem uh, was kind of certainly well known for that. Um, after the destruction of the French Revolution. Okay, remember, the French Revolution wreaked havoc all over Europe. Okay, so monasteries, religious life destroyed everywhere. Uh, lots of people dead. You know, remember, you know, the goddess reason was enthroned on the high altar of Notre Dame in Paris, right? Um, and there's this kind of, of course, reaction to that when people are like, okay, we need God, okay? And we need to understand what this Catholic faith is. And so monasteries became very much uh, alive during this period in the middle of the 19th century. And that movement acquired a serious academic component with advances in research on the history of the liturgy. Right? Until the 19th century, we often didn't really know a lot about how the Mass was celebrated throughout history. Right? Catholics just kind of did what they did. They didn't ask why they did what they did. Uh, but all of a sudden, you know, it's like, okay, we need to understand. Like, how did this come about? Right? So 19th century, lots of advances in that kind of scholarship as well as a theological component in dialogue with the latest scholarship in biblical, dogmatic, and moral theology. Now, the problem is that movement remained the preserve of a certain elite in monastic and university settings, right? until priests like Romano Guardini, uh, who ended up working in Germany, and Pius Parsh in Austria, sought to bring out the pastoral and practical implications of those insights by applying them in an experimental way to worship on the parish level. Right? Because up until that point, people said, okay, well, you know what, that's great for monks, right? Or that's okay in a university setting. But, you know, you can't actually do this in a parish. That's impossible. And Romano Guardini and Pius Bar says, mm, I think you can. And here's how we're going to try it. Here's how we're going to do it. Now, of course, sometimes things that seem like a good idea at the time, in retrospect, are like, eh, some things we didn't think about. So a heady mix of archaeologizing antiquarianism and flirtation with theological as well as artistic and cultural modernism, alongside a serious dose of romantic idealism, transformed the movement into something that produced the reform of the liturgy during the middle of the 20th century. Now, the liturgical reform of the last century has marked profound changes in Catholic identity and practice. If you ask most people what happened in the Catholic Church in the 1960s, or what happened at Vatican II, what they're going to talk about is something about the liturgy, right? So the mass changed, right? That's what they're going to say. So Guardini and his cohorts were perhaps naively overconfident in their own ability to renew Christian practice in their time by aggressively propagating their own insights as a pastoral plan for the modern world. Now, much of that was part of that phenomenon has contributed positively to the life of the church. That can be said. But there are also shadows and penumbras of shadows, and various crises have marked the life of the church in our time. To such an extent that Ratzinger would write, I am convinced that the crisis in the church that we are experiencing today is to a large extent due to the disintegration of the liturgy. Remember how, you know, that beautiful maxim of Prosper, uh, Prosper of Aquitaine, you know, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi, or lex agendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief, is the law of action. If you mess with one of those things, the other th is going to kind of follow, right? Now, Guardini's 1930 book, from which I quoted at the beginning of this talk, that book called The Spirit of the Liturgy, okay, in many ways was seen as a watershed moment in which the classical monastic liturgical movement, 
morphed into something different, okay? more pastoral, more practical. Its insights inspired the work of an entire generation of vibrant Catholic intellectual advancement. But it also unleashed forces and dynamics in the church that need to be rethought and re-envisioned in the light of the experience of the church after those ideas brought about significant changes in the way we worship. Now, Josef Alois Ratzinger okay, was born on April 16, 1927, in the fiercely Catholic region of Bavaria in Germany. Okay? He was born on Holy Saturday, and in those days, the great Paschal Vigil was celebrated late in the morning, uh, as its time had crept backwards over the centuries from its original place in the night. And he was actually baptized on the same day he was born, which is pretty unusual, right? even for that time period. Um, usually, you know, Mama is kind of, you know, still kind of rather exhausted at that point, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, Frau Rassinger is like, I want this baby baptized, go, do it. So, but he was born uh, and baptized with the water that had been blessed at the font at the mother of all vigils. And that timing put him on a trajectory of living the liturgy in a unique way uh, his whole life. His family imparted to him a vivid sense of the reality of the rites and ceremonies of the church. To such an extent that at seven years old, he even wrote uh, the Christ child, so our kind of, you know, Santa Claus, right, to bring him a missile with Latin on one side and German on the other so that he could follow the mass better, okay? He was seven years old, right? And so that's why I think it's always important for us to not discount how important it is for the liturgical formation of our children, Right? You know, sometimes we're like, oh, nobody can understand that when they're seven. Well, they can actually, right? Uh, it's a spiritual understanding, uh, and it forms both the intellect and the character. And that was something that we see in the life of the really young Josef Ratzinger. So there's no surprise that um, Georg Genswein, who would be the secretary to Ratzinger and then to Benedict XVI, uh, reported uh, in this new book that has come out uh, about his life um, that one of the cardinals said of Ratzinger that he has the mind of a father of the church and the piety of a first communion child. Right? So that to me is like the perfect combination, isn't it? So... so some people have the mind of, you know, of a seven-year-old and then the piety of the evil one. So, yeah, not Ratzinger, thanks be to God. So Ratzinger brought his considerable intellectual skills to bear on a renewed understanding of the ultimate why behind the what and the how of worship. Okay? What is the liturgy? What happens? What actually happens during the liturgy? What kind of reality do we encounter here? These are the first words of Ratzinger's book that has the same name as Guardini's 1930s text, The Spirit of the Liturgy. And they sum up the entire project that Ratzinger moved forward in liturgical theology and informed his work at the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in documents such as Ecclesia de Eucharistia in 2003 and Redemptione Sacramentum in 2004, as well as Sacramentum Caritatis in 2007, two years after his election as Pope. As a church, we would never have had those incredible documents had Ratzinger not been Ratzinger, right? And Benedict not been Benedict. I mean, they really are incredible gifts to the life of the church. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you get a chance to read those, they really are worth your time. And then the practical insights brought forth from his theological work saw the birth of Samorum Pontificum in 2007. 
which was the document that uh, recognized that you know the extraordinary form of the Roman Rite uh, could be celebrated at any time. It didn't need to, it did not need to be restricted. And then Anglicanorum Cetibus in 2009, which saw that there were many Anglicans whose entire theology and liturgy and spirituality, you know, kind of was moving towards unity with the Catholic Church. And so those two incredible documents from his time as Pope, again, informed by that sense of the living reality of the sacred liturgy. Now, the first documents I mentioned, right, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, Redemptione Sacramentum, and Sacramentum Caritatis, were geared to curb abuses and excesses in the liturgy celebrated according to the books that came forth from the liturgical reform. The other two documents, so Samorum Pontificum and Anglicanorum Cetibus, paved the way for more frequent celebrations of the pre-conciliar liturgical tradition, as well as the integration of Anglican text into Catholic worship in a context of realized ecumenism. Now, the spirit of the liturgy, however, right, okay, this book right here, okay, is not a document of the teaching authority of the church, is it? Okay, it's not a document of the magisterium. It is a theological work whose insights inform later approaches of the magisterium to the question of the liturgy. But even Benedict XVI himself wrote in his book, What is Christianity?, uh, which has been published after his death, right? So we're waiting anxiously uh, the English translation. In not a few seminaries, students caught reading my books are considered unworthy for the priesthood. My books are concealed as dangerous literature and are read only in hiding. Even though he was the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at the time of its publication and recognized as one of the most formidable intellectuals at the time, the spirit of the liturgy was received by many in the establishment of Catholic academia with the same wonderment as Romano Guardini's book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, okay, surely this is an exaggeration, right? It, that can't be. What Benedict says about, you know, seminarians getting caught reading these books considered unworthy of the priesthood. Well, let me share with you a personal anecdote. I was in my first year at the Pontifical Roman Major Seminary, the seminary in which priests are formed for the Diocese of Rome. Okay, so it is the papal seminary, right? in the year 2000 when the book was published. And I remember I brought this book right here, <laughs> I mean, literally this book, into the chapel to read during my adoration time. Okay? And I was chastised by other seminarians for so imprudently reading such a dangerous book in the open. Right? I will never forget to my dying day of a seminarian kind of you know, going up to me in the chapel Right, saying, have you lost your mind? I'm like, why? You're reading this? I'm like, yeah, why are you worried about what I'm reading? I just saw it beeline from the other side of the chapel. So he exchanged the book cover <laughs> for another one from a collection of the encyclicals of Paul VI that were considered safe to prevent my getting kicked out of the seminary. Okay. I probably would not be here speaking to you today had I been discovered reading this dangerous book with this on it, so, which obviously I put back on the book. So, 22 years later, and this text is a classic of the emerging new liturgical movement, and an entire generation of priests and seminarians who entered formation in the third millennium of Christianity have been profoundly changed and inspired by this book. And so if you're going to understand the mentality of many of my brother priests ordained in the last 20 years, you must read this book. So we've talked a lot about you know, the history of the book and, and why it's important. So I'm going to share some passages with you for discussion. Okay, so Ignatius Press published the English translation of it in 2000, okay? 
In 2014, the first published volume of Ratzinger's collected works contained the text. Okay. Uh, it's actually, I think, volume seven in the series, but they put volume seven out first. Why? Because it had this in it. In 2018, Ignatius Press published a commemorative volume with both Guardini and Ratzinger's works along a new preface by Robert Cardinal Sada, who was at the time the prefect for the Congregation for Divine Worship. And unfortunately, that commemorative volume is hard to find. If you look at it on Amazon, it's now like, you know, hundreds of dollars. And I have, of course, conveniently lost my copy, but at least I have this one, right? Um, but others, the others are easier to locate on the internet. So the book is divided into four parts. The first part is the essence of the liturgy. And it discusses the place of the liturgy in Christian life. Okay? The relationship between worship and salvation history and the cosmos, as well as how the scriptures form Christian worship from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Okay? We have four parts. I'm going to explain every part, and I'm going to read one excerpt from each part to give you a little taster of how all of this is just so absolutely wonderful. And I'll kind of comment as we go along. Does that sound all right? So, okay. Okay. In the Old Testament, there is a series of very impressive testimonies to the truth that the liturgy is not a matter of what you please. Okay. You've heard me say from the pulpit, the Mass is not about you. Okay, this is where it comes from. Okay. <laughs> Nowhere is this more dramatically evident than in the narrative of the golden calf. Remember that story from the book of Exodus. The cult conducted by the high priest Aaron is not meant to serve any of the false gods of the heathen. The apostasy is is more subtle. There is no obvious turning away from God to the false gods. Outward, the people remain completely attached to the same God. They want to glorify the God who led Israel out of Egypt and believe that they may very properly represent his mysterious power in the image of a bull calf. Everything seems to be in order. Presumably, even the ritual is in complete conformity to the rubrics. And yet, it is a falling away from the worship of God to idolatry. This is important. It's not just about observing all of the external outward forms of the sacred liturgy, right? Because you can do that and still go to hell. So that doesn't mean you're actually worshiping God just because you do the stuff right, okay? Um, there tends to be this whole idea... Um, kind of an overcorrection from liturgical abuses. You know, sometimes you hear, uh, say the black, do the red, okay? Say the black father that's in your book and do the little red colored instructions, okay? Now, that's not a bad advice, right? But there's more to it than that. This apostasy, I mean, that's a pretty charged word, isn't it? I mean, apostasy is not a word you just kind of throw out there. This apostasy, which outwardly is scarcely perceptible, has two causes. First, there's a violation of the prohibition of images. The people can't cope with the invisible, remote, and mysterious God. They want to bring him down into their own world, into what they can see and understand. Worship is no longer going up to God, but drawing God down into one's own world. He must be there when he is needed, and must be the kind of God that is needed. Man is using God, and in reality, even if it is not outwardly discernible, he's placing himself above God. This gives us a clue to the second point. The worship of the golden calf is a self-generated cult. When Moses stays away for too long and God himself becomes inaccessible, the people just fetch him back. Worship becomes a feast that the community gives itself, a festival of self-affirmation. You know, sometimes you have people that they'll come and they say, you know, Father, I just don't get anything out of Mass. It's not about you. Get over yourself. <laughs> it's not about you. There's nothing about this which is about you. But there are many people who, if they walk away from Mass, you know, thinking that, you know, they haven't been affirmed in themselves, that somehow there's something lacking in the Mass, right? Benedict said this is apostasy, right? This is a violation of the first commandment. It's a pretty serious thing. Instead of being the worship of God, it becomes a circle closed in on itself. 
eating, drinking, and making merry. The dance around the golden calf is an image of this self-seeking worship. It is a kind of banal self-gratification. The narrative of the golden calf is a warning about any kind of self-initiated and self-seeking worship. Ultimately, it is no longer concerned with God, but with giving oneself a nice little alternative world manufactured from one's own resources. Then liturgy really does become pointless, just fooling around. Or still worse, it becomes an apostasy from the living God, an apostasy in sacral disguise. All that is left in the end is frustration, a feeling of emptiness, There's no experience of that liberation which always takes place when man encounters the living God. This is just one paragraph here. That's a lot of stuff, right? It's a whole book like this. I think that what is so incredible about this is that what Benedict is trying to do is to bring us back to the spiritual reality of worship. And that when we think about the reality that we have got to come to terms with of so many Catholics leaving the faith, right? Um, Why are they leaving the faith, right? Because they haven't had a true encounter with the living God because how they have become conditioned to think about worship is that it is about them. And so then when it doesn't respond to that need, then they're like, well, why am I wasting my time? Right? That's why it is absolutely crucial for us to go back to the true spiritual sense of the liturgy. So second part is time and space in the liturgy. And this discusses what it means for certain times and places to be holy the significance of the church building, the question of the altar, and the direction of the priest and people at Mass, the reservation of the Blessed Sacrament, and how time is envisioned in a specifically Christian way in the liturgy. Um, This is important because I think, remember how we talked about, you know, around Vatican II, everybody thinks of all of the changes, right? Okay, the priest faces the people, the Blessed Sacrament is reserved somewhere else. Um, All of those things are what most people picked up on in the liturgical reform. And so so the space-related issues, but also kind of the time-related issues as well, right? You know, what does it mean to have a saint's feast day, right? What does it mean to celebrate Advent as opposed to Christmas or Lent as opposed to Easter, et cetera, et cetera? So I'm going to read one of my favorite things here. This is is a little bit longer, so I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit. But what about the altar? In what direction should we pray during the Eucharistic liturgy? In Byzantine buildings, the structure just described was by and large retained, but in Rome, a somewhat different arrangement developed. The bishop's chair was shifted to the center of the apse so that the altar was moved into the nave. This was the case in the Lateran Basilica, remember the Pope's Cathedral, and St. Mary Majors well into the 9th century. However, in St. Peter's, during the pontificate of St. Gregory the Great, the altar was moved near the bishop's chair, probably for the simple reason that he was supposed to stand as much as possible above the tomb of St. Peter. This was an outward and visible expression of the truth that we celebrate the sacrifice of the Lord in the communion of saints, a communion spanning all times and ages. The custom of erecting an altar above the tombs of the martyrs probably goes back a long way, and is an outcome of the same motivation. Throughout history, the martyrs continue Christ's self-oblation. They are like the church's living altar. What a tremendously beautiful kind of turn of phrase. May not of stones, but of men who have become members of the body of Christ and express a new cultus. Sacrifice is humanity becoming love with Christ. What an incredible definition of sacrifice, right? You know, often we tend to think of sacrifice in very negative terms, like I got to give up something, right? Sacrifice is humanity becoming love with Christ. Yeah, 
it's just incredible. The ordering of St. Peter's was then copied, so it would seem in other stational churches in Rome. We don't need to go into the d- details of this process. The controversy in our own century was triggered by another innovation. Because of topographical circumstances, it turned out that St. Peter's faced west. Thus, if the celebrating priest wanted to face east, as the Christian tradition of prayer demands, he had to stand behind the people and look towards the people. For whatever reason it was done, one can also see this arrangement in a whole series of church buildings within St. Peter's direct sphere of influence. The liturgical renewal in our century took up this alleged model and developed from it a new idea for the form of the liturgy. The Eucharist, so it was said, had to be celebrated toward the people. The altar, as can be seen in the Normandy model of St. Peter's, had to be positioned in such a way that priests and people looked at each other and formed together the circle of the celebrating community. This alone so it was said, was compatible with the meaning of the Christian liturgy, with the requirement of active participation. This alone conformed to the primordial model of the Last Supper. Right? You know, sometimes people will say, well, did Jesus turn his back to you on the Last Supper? Of course not. You know, would you invite someone to dinner and then turn your back to them? Okay. But that is not the point, right? That's what Benedict is trying to get at. These arguments seemed in the end so persuasive that after the council, which says nothing about turning toward the people, new altars were set up everywhere. And today, celebration versus populum, that's the the Latin term for facing the people, really does look like the most characteristic fruit of Vatican II's liturgical renewal. In fact, it is the most conspicuous consequence of a reordering that not only signifies a new arrangement of the places dedicated to the liturgy, but also brings with it a new idea of the essence of the liturgy, the liturgy as a communal meal. This is, of course, a misunderstanding of the significance of the Roman Basilica and of the positioning of its altar, and the representation of the Last Supper is also, to say the least, inaccurate. Okay? Consider what Louis Bouillet, who is another one of those kind of uh, Catholic intellectuals of the last century, had to say. The idea that a celebration facing the people must have been the primitive one has no other foundation than a mistaken view of what a meal could be in antiquity, Christian or not. In no meal of the early Christian era did the president of the banqueting assembly ever face the other participants. They were all sitting or reclining on the convex side of a C-shaped table, or a table having approximately the shape of a horseshoe. The other side was always left empty for the service. Nowhere in Christian antiquity could have arisen the idea of having to face the people to preside a meal. The communal character of a meal was emphasized just by the opposite direction, the fact that all the participants were on the same side of the table. Okay? I think this is important, right? Because almost universally in the Catholic Church today, Mass is facing the people because intellectuals got it wrong. They're like, well, that's the way it was at St. Peter's. So obviously, right, this is how it was in antiquity. But we know now that this absolutely is not actually the case. So we've invented this whole reason for celebrating Mass in a certain way, which is bogus. (laughs) So why do we keep doing this? I mean, it really is a question that I think we need to kind of grapple with. Um, I'm going to go... Okay. Let me again quote Bouillet. Never and nowhere have we any indication that any importance or even attention was given to whether the priest celebrated with the people before him or behind him. As Professor Cyril Vogel has recently demonstrated, the only thing ever insisted upon or ever mentioned was that he should say the Eucharistic prayer as all the other prayers facing east. Even when the orientation of the church enabled the celebrant to pray turned toward the people, when at the altar he must not forget that it was not the priest alone who then turned east, it was the whole congregation together with him. It seems very strange to us today, but that whole idea of facing east, right, from the place of the rising sun, right, with the connection with the resurrection, is that the people would turn their backs to the altar to face east during the Eucharistic prayer. 
right? It wasn't a, well, I want to look at the, I want to look at the priest. It was like, well, no. <laughs> so again, we have such a significant symbolic change in the way that we've celebrated the liturgy, which is based on bogus history. Right? So again, at a certain point, we've got to ask ourselves, why do we keep doing this? Right? What is this really all about? So the third part is art and liturgy. This section explores the visual arts and music and worship and explains that they are not add-ons, right, but integral parts to the liturgy. Right? Uh, particularly in this country, there are a lot of people who, for them, music and liturgy are really two different things. Right? So you've got the Mass, and then it doesn't really matter what music you have at mass, right? That's a matter of taste. Some people like guitar masses, some people like Christian rock, some people like the organ, some people like chant, some people like orchestral masses, and you know, it doesn't really matter, right? So that's what you know many people think. But that isn't the case, right? The liturgy has its own music, right? And it's not extraneous in any way to the liturgy. Um, you know, one thing that has become very common, remember how I talked about how, you know, centuries ago, you had this disconnect between the priest and the people? Well, one of the ways in which you saw that was that very frequently what the musicians were doing up in the choir loft didn't always have a direct connection with what was happening at the altar, right? So everything was kind of discombobulated, right? Um, the strange thing is that we still haven't actually changed that <laughs> in many respects, right? And so people want to kind of bring it down to a matter of taste of things that I like instead of what is the real connection between music and the liturgy? How can you get out of this whole cycle of saying that this is about, you know, just personal preference? Now, you would think in a parish like Prince of Peace, right, that... Uh, uh, this wouldn't necessarily be the case, but I'll tell you, it is. I got an email this week complaining about the fact that we were doing the Latin Gloria at the English Novus Ordo Masses. And the email said, well, I know you like Latin, but I don't like Latin. So, And you, you can imagine how I responded to that. So I said, dear sir, comma, all caps, which you know what that means, the Mass is not about you. <laughs> if the Mass were about me... I would probably be having all kinds of fun and exciting music at Mass. It had nothing to do with the liturgy, because right? I like all kinds of weird music, right? So, but that's not what it's about. I said, it's not about all of these things. And I said, you know, you know the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council ordered priests to make sure that their faithful could participate in the Mass in the language of the church, which is Latin. Okay. Now, is it the case that most priests are derelict in their duty? Yes. You know, you go to Rome and invariably, you know, you go to a, an audience and everybody sings the Our Father together in Latin. You can tell an American immediately. The Nigerians are singing in Latin. The Koreans are singing in Latin. The Italians are singing in Latin. Everybody except for the Americans are singing in Latin. Right. So, again, why? Okay. It's not anything like because you know, Americans aren't particularly intelligent, right? It's because the priests aren't doing their duty that was ordered them to do by an ecumenical council, right? So uh, I'm going to read again about art and liturgy. I'm sorry, lit uh, yeah, art and liturgy. After the cultural revolution of recent decades, we are faced with a challenge no less great than that of three moments of crisis that we have encountered in our historical sketch. The Gnostic temptation, the crisis at the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of modernity, and the crisis at the beginning of the 20th century, which formed the prelude to the still more radical questions of the present day. Three developments in recent music epitomize the problems that the church has to face when she's considering liturgical music. First of all, there is the cultural universalization that the church has to undertake if she wants to get beyond the boundaries of the European mind. This is the question of what enculturation should look like in the realm of sacred music. If, on the one hand, the identity of Christianity is to be preserved, and on the other, its universality is to be expressed in local forms. Then there are two developments in music itself that have their origins primarily in the West, but that for a long time have affected the whole of mankind in the world culture that is being formed. 
modern so-called classical music has maneuvered itself, with some exceptions, into an elitist ghetto, which only specialists may enter, and even they do so with what may sometimes be mixed feelings. The music of the masses has broken loose from this and treads a very different path. On the one hand, there is pop music, which is certainly no longer supported by the people in the ancient sense. It is aimed at the phenomenon of the masses, is industrially produced, and ultimately has to be described as a cult of the banal. Rock, on the other hand, is the expression of elemental passions, and at rock festivals it assumes a cultic character, a form of worship, in fact in opposition to Christian worship. Okay. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has been to like Coachella <laughs> or any of these like huge, crazy music. Some of you may have been at Woodstock. I don't know. Um, but he's right, isn't it? I mean, people have this whole religion of music and they are awfully ritualistic about it all, right? In their approach to these things, right? It really, really is inc incredible. But I think the other thing which is interesting, what he's saying here is... Also, the phenomenon of the industrially, industrially produced and ultimately has to be described as a cult of the banal. Um, people can't sing anymore. They honestly don't know how to sing. Okay? It used to be that in every relatively working and middle class home, you'd have a piano and at least one person would know how to play it. Right? And in the evenings, somebody would be playing the piano and you'd sit around and you'd sing. Right? There are people who had songs that were part of their culture. And it wasn't just at church, right? And then you'd go to church and you'd sing at church. Right? And I always complain about how Catholics don't sing, but that's another, you know, kind of thing for another culture, as you know. But in general, our people, we don't sing, right? You know? And so because of that, it's become almost the preserve of specialists, right? People are like, well, I don't have a good voice, so I can't ever sing a note, right? And then those who do have to be on auto-tune. Right? I mean, most of our uh, you know, uh, guiding lights of the pop music world, if you actually heard them sing without auto-tune, it would be like, oh, God, what is that? Like, you're trying to kill cats. Like, what is that? Because they don't know how to sing either, right? You know, St. Paul talks about, you know, about doing things with art, right? And we've made uh, music into this kind of preserve of elitists, right? I remember my mom and I used to get into knockdown, drag out fights when I was a kid because she hated classical music. You know, she was a big pop person. Whitney Houston, she could sing all day long <laughs> by memory, and she was absolutely fantastic at it. But she also knew her Negro spirituals from growing up and knew all of those. And so she literally used to sing all day long. And of course, because I was a nerd, I would go to the Greenville County Library and, you know, you know, find Rachmaninoff or, you know, whatever, and put, it, oh, God, the death music, you know, so and it was this constant thing back and forth. Um, because, again, there was this whole kind of idea that classical music or opera or things like that are just for, like, a certain type of people, and we're not that kind of people, so why are we doing that, right? Uh, luckily, my mom had been raised as one of those kind of people, so she still kind of imparted some of that despite herself, right? Um, but I think that that situation is becoming more and more prevalent, um, which is why in our school we place so much emphasis on musical literacy, right? So that the children, by the time they graduate, they know how to read a piece of music and they know how to play an instrument. It could be a recorder, but they still know how to do that, right? And they know how to participate in a whole repertoire of English hymnody, of Latin music, of, uh, you know, old school Disney tunes, of like all kinds of things, right, that are still musical in their nature. Now, to keep going, let's see. Um, People are, so to speak, released from themselves by the experience of being part of a crowd and by the emotional shock of rhythm, noise, and special lighting effects. And so then when they go to mass, they're like, bored, right? So where's the light show? But, you know, I go to, I won't say the name of, you know, fill in the blank, non-denominational church, right? They got a light show. Why don't you have a light show? Right? Father, you get so many more young people if you have a light show. Right? So, and wore skinny jeans instead of a cassock. Nobody wants to see that. Right? 
However, in the ecstasy of having all their defenses torn down, the participants sink, as it were, beneath the elemental force of the universe. I think that might be a little bit exaggerated as a phrase, but that's what he says. The music of the Holy Spirit's sober inebriation seems to have little chance when self has become a prison. The mind is a shackle, and breaking out from both appears as a true promise of redemption that can be tasted for at least a few moments. Right? Music has an effect on the soul. You know, what we take into our body, if you, if you eat junk food all the time, you're not going to be healthy, right? If all you do is internalize, you know, emotive music that's there to um, manipulate your emotions, that's, that's what it's designed to do, then are you going to get beyond that prison, right? Whereas true music has a liberating quality to it. Now, the fourth and final part is called liturgical form. In its first chapter, Ratzinger explains what it means to, for liturgy to have a certain form to it, or what we call a rite. Its second chapter, the body and the liturgy, is further subdivided into seven different topics related to how externals manifest some underlying theological or spiritual truth behind the rites of worship. And we have kind of a longer excerpt here. And all of this is just to kind of give you a sense of, of this so that when you read it yourself, you're like, oh, I remember Father talking about that. So, let us ask the question again. What does right mean in the context of Christian liturgy? The answer is... It is the expression that has become form of ecclesiality and of the church's identity as a historically transcendent communion of liturgical prayer and action. Right makes concrete the liturgy's bond with that living subject which is the church, who for her part is characterized by adherence to the form of faith that is developed in the apostolic tradition. This bond with the subject that is the church allows for different patterns of liturgy and includes living development, but it equally excludes spontaneous improvisation. Okay? So what he means here is that you know, we don't all have to do everything in the same way. Right? So it can be different in different places. Um, and it's something that's alive. It's not this kind of fossil Right, that you just kind of keep doing it. We've always done it this way for 2,000 years. We're going to do it exactly the same way. Well, that's not quite the point of a right. But that also means that you can't just kind of you know, make it up as you go along. Right? This applies to the individual and the community, to the hierarchy and the laity. Because of the historical character of God's action, the divine liturgy has been fashioned by human beings and their capacities. But it contains an essential exposition of the biblical legacy that goes beyond the limits of individual rights and thus shares in the authority of the church's faith in its fundamental form. The authority of the liturgy can be compared to that of the great confessions of faith of the early church. Like these, it developed under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. We think of what we believe as Catholics in terms of the creed, right? That's what we believe. He's saying the liturgy is what we believe as well as the creeds. It was the tragedy of Luther's efforts at reform that they occurred at a time when the essential form of the liturgy was not understood and had to a large extent been obscured. Despite the radicalism of his reversion to the principle of scripture alone, Luther did not contest the validity of the ancient Christian creeds and thereby left behind an inner tension that became the fundamental problem in the history of the Reformation. The Reformation would have run a different course if Luther had been able to see the binding force of the great liturgical tradition and its understanding of sacrificial presence and of man's participation in the vicarious action of the logos, of the word. Okay? Scripture is scripture only when it lives within the living subject that is the church. The word didn't come down from heaven to become a book that we argue over. That's his point. Right? You know, our Protestant brothers and sisters, you know, their approach to uh, the scripture, right, um, tends to be kind of disanchored from the living reality in the life of the church, right? Because again, it's a radical individualist thing. 
right? You know, it's it, it, individual interpretation of scripture is the hallmark of Protestantism. And Ratzinger reminds us that, that what scripture really is, is the life of the church, right? It's not just a bunch of words in a book, this makes it all the more absurd that a not insignificant number of people today are trying to construct the liturgy afresh, afresh on the basis of sola scriptura. So one of the things that was part of the discussions at, at Vatican II was literally taking everything out of the Mass which was not from Scripture. Like everything. In these reconstructions, they identify Scripture with the prevailing opinions, thus confusing faith with opinion. Liturgy manufactured in this way is based on human words and opinions. It's a house built on sand and remains totally empty, however much human artistry may adorn it. Only respect for the liturgy's fundamental unspontaneity and pre-existing identity can give us what we hope for, the feast in which the great reality comes to us that we ourselves do not manufacture but receive as a gift. You know, if we receive the living reality lived in the experience of the church, of Christ, then we're not making it up as we go along, right? It's lived within the context of the church. This means that creativity cannot be an authentic category for matters liturgical. Okay. Um, sometimes I come across other priests and they're like, well, tell me about your liturgy committee. And I say... I am the liturgy committee. <laughs> well, but how do, you, how do you decide to do, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C? And I said, we don't. And they're just going to look at me. I'm like, we read the book. We just do the book. <gasps> oh, that's so boring. And I'm like, but it's, it, but that's what the liturgy is, right? Um, I remember being in a parish, which I will not say which one it is, uh, in which we had a very large liturgy committee that met very frequently. And I would get into knock down, drag out fights over things because they would want to do things which were actually forbidden by the, the rubrics of the church. And so, well, I think it's a good idea if we do X, Y, and Z. No, well, why? Well, because that's not a thing, right? And uh, you can see that when that mentality begins to take over, you know, the liturgy becomes an expression, in theory, right, of ourselves as a community. But it never really is, is it? It's usually a clique within the community that then impose on everybody else what they think is a good idea, right? And then other people suffer because they're like, well, I think that's a terrible idea. Why do I have to listen to this? And what... Ratzinger slash Benedict is, is getting us to understand is that, you know, all of this kind of creativity, let's make a meaningful worship experience, is not coherent with what the liturgy actually is all about, right? And again, is a problem. Yes, the liturgy becomes personal, true, and new, not through tomfoolery and banal experiments with words, but through a courageous entry into the great reality that through the right is always ahead of us and can never quite be overtaken. It's a beautiful turn of phrase as well. Um, we enter into the reality of Christ crucified and risen in the liturgy. Okay. And if we're trying to tinker around with it, right, uh, on our own level and according to our own lights, then we're not, you know, kind of really entering into that reality. Now, of course, the thing is, rights are, you know, invented by men in some sense, right, or women. So, I mean, they, they are like that, but they are a corporate work of the entire church and then celebrated within the entire church, right? And so that doesn't mean that there can't be kind of, you know, local adaptations for some kind of reasons, whether they be cultural or practical. Um, but that's different than kind of, you know, inventing our own worship experience. That is a very profoundly un-Catholic idea. So, that's again just a little bit of taste of this particular book. Um, it's not a matter of just saying, well, I'm going to tell you everything that's wrong with the liturgy, right? Or it's not, well, how I would like to celebrate Mass, right? That's not the point of this book. It's, again, why are we doing what we're doing? And to go back to the fundamental understanding of the reality of sacred worship. And the value of this work is that it really is a truly classic work. 
It isn't a mere response to certain questions bound to the time in which we are reading it now. It is a theological approach to the why behind the what and the how of the liturgy. It is grounded in scripture and the documents of the magisterium without using them to merely proof text to advance ideological arguments for changes to the way we worship. That's not the kind of book that this is. And as such, it is as relevant today as it was over 20 years ago, and it will continue to nourish the minds and souls of generations to come. So tonight, I'd like to close with the closing words of this text. So spoiler alert, I get to reveal the end to you, um, which has meant so much to me, and I hope that it means a lot to you as well. God has acted in history, and through history, given the gifts of the earth their significance. The elements become sacraments through connection with the unique history of God in relation to man in Jesus Christ. As we've said before, incarnation does not mean doing as we please. On the contrary, it binds us to the history of a particular time. Outwardly, that history may seem fortuitous, but it is the form of history willed by God. And for us, it is the trustworthy trace he has imprinted on the earth, the guarantee that we're not thinking up things for ourselves, but are truly touched by God and come into touch with him. Precisely through what is particular and once for all, the here and now, we emerge from the ever and never vagueness of mythology. It is with this particular face, with this particular human form, that Christ comes to us. And precisely thus does he make us brethren beyond all boundaries. Precisely thus do we recognize him. It is the Lord. Thank you. Thank you.